Did you know that Factorio isn't infinite? It actually has an edge. You can just go there, and it's only one million tiles away. So yeah, good luck. Just for reference, simply walking to the edge would take you over 32 hours straight. Even with a train, the fastest method of transportation in the game, it would take you over three hours of driving. And that's not including all of the water and biters in your way. You'd basically need to be an idiot to try and get there. So naturally, as the man at the forefront of stupid wastes of time, I've decided to make it my mission to reach the end of the world. And not only reach it, but reach it in style. Now there's been a couple of people who have made the pilgrimage to the end, but none to my knowledge that did it on default settings. That includes cliffs, water, biters, trees, and all those fun things. And failing that, I'll bet I'm the first person to try and reach it completely autonomously. That's right, instead of manually plowing through nests and over water for several days, why not just build a machine that does that all for me while I simply sit back and relax? This is an automation game after all, and that's what automation is all about. However, all of that is but a distant dream right now because I don't even have a proper base set up yet. So I guess I'll need to figure that out first. Like I said, I started this all on default settings, but I've increased the resource patches to their maximum settings for the simple reason that I want to see just how big they'll get at the end of the world. But it'll be nice to make building the base a little bit easier. So I'm just doing the normal early game stuff of mining directly into furnaces and setting up some coal snakes for easy access to fuel for hand feeding. If you've got free time, you should always mine rocks, seeing as it saves you tons of time and pollution spent mining stone patches to get stone furnaces. And as always, compared to iron, you barely need any copper in the early game, so one or two miners is enough. My water is a little far from my ore patches, so I just bring that up with some underground pipes and set up some early power. I've also got a lab right here, and obviously the first thing we want to research is automation. That'll set a good tone for the rest of this run, but the main utility is that I can set up some rudimentary factories. Like this one that makes science at a slow but steady pace as long as I keep plates in the chest. And then I could do the same thing with electronic circuits. If you're trying to expand early on, this sort of setup is invaluable because it's extremely easy to make and saves you tons of time crafting the circuits you need for both miners and inserters. I'll also do the same with belts and some gears, which will also save me tons of time. Really, I'm just having a great time playing the game normally for once. Then some biters show up, and I remember that I can't totally relax. Default settings biters are pretty tame, though. I do set up some ammo production, however, and some gun turrets. Next item on my agenda is to set up some furnace stacks. This is what all those early items were for. These furnace stacks are one of the few things that'll make every game without ever really changing the design, because they're already just so perfect. 48 furnaces perfectly turns one full belt of ore into plates, and it's extremely easy to put in the furnace fuel like this. I'll also need some more power poles, and there's like no trees around, so I've got to go on a bit of a journey. And then a bunch more biters show up. To be fair, I forgot to actually put more ammo into the turrets, so this is what happens. But anyway, at this point, we'll want to transition to electric miners. That'll get us some fully automated iron, and we'll do the same for copper. Okay, I've got biters on my coal and biters on my iron. This is getting really annoying. Usually in default settings, you can solve all of your biter problems by simply placing some turrets around the nearby nests, but dealing with this one nest barely helped at all. I'm pretty sure I didn't accidentally choose Death World, but apparently the games decided to spawn me in the biggest, most barren desert I've ever seen. Usually there's at least some trees absorbing pollution, but not this run. After playing last run, the sight of so many biters triggered a fight-or-flight response, and my body started acting all on its own, causing me to build spaghetti out of pure instinct. The point is to get circuits and supplies up as fast as possible without wasting any time, but at the expense of future expandability. It's a bit of an overreaction to vanilla biters, but whatever. I'm a professional, and I'm sure I can make this work somehow. Anyway, as you can see, I've got the most important things like belts, turrets, inserters, miners, and assemblers out of the way, so I can start making some science. It's really basic, and oh my god. <laughs> Seriously, this isn't Death World. For all the noobs that were unlucky enough to get spawned into maps like this, I'm sorry for you. Depending on your tree coverage, it can be hours before you encounter your first biter, but with zero trees, well, you get this. I was looking forward to a nice relaxing start, but if the biters want to tango, they'll find I'm the wrong man to mess with. 
Here's green science. I'm going pretty fast here because this isn't the main focus of the run, but if you want to get to the end of the world, you're gonna need a base to do it. Here's some more power, and we've got a respectable start going. Not the best layout, but, you know, it's just my starter base. These biter attacks might seem scary, but they're mostly just a nuisance. With fully automated ammo production up, there's not much they can do apart from annoying me and forcing me to rebuild my miners occasionally. But anyway, here's some stone bricks, because I'd like to switch to actual walls instead of needing to bust out the emergency defensive furnaces again. At least now my mines shouldn't explode as long as I don't forget to reload the ammo from time to time. Next thing I'll need is steel, and we can get that by simply making two furnace stacks and routing the output of the first one into the second. The massive iron patch makes this pretty comfortable. I won't need to worry about expanding for quite some time. Also, I've got grenades now! Okay, first thing I'll use that steel for is making red ammo, because yellow ammo won't be enough for when the medium biters start showing up. Normally I hate needing to spend so many resources on ammo, but we've got more than enough. I've also got some of those engines I set up so I can build a car. It's useful for scouting around and confirming just how big this massive desert is, but I can also take out these smaller nests with it. It's much less than trees, but each chunk of land does absorb pollution, so killing the nests closest to us, even if it won't stop the nests from absorbing pollution entirely, it will result in them absorbing less pollution. And yeah, this is really one big desert, isn't it? Again, my pollution cloud is going to spread out to more nests pretty much immediately, but it's an improvement. During my drive, I found a nice oil field down here, so that'll be my next goal. But first, I'd like to automate a bunch more things, like belts. This design is pretty easy, and just gets them out of the way. I'll also want the red belts to eventually upgrade my furnace stack. Also, because I've got walls and red ammo already, I've pretty much finished military science without even trying, so I might as well make some grenades and put them all together, seeing as I've been having biter problems. Routing it into the labs is fun, and I'm already feeling the spaghetti curse upon me. I'm already running low on iron, and this is one thing I'd really like to show noobs. If you don't have enough iron, just make more. It's that easy. And a couple minutes is all it takes for me to tack on another iron stack, and that'll let me make all the belts I want. And now I'm automating trains and train accessories, as well as all of the buildings we'll need for oil refining. Now it's time for even more power. All of these together is exactly 48 megawatts, which will keep me going for a while. And looking at all these turret nests, you can tell that I've been having so much fun constantly being nibbled at. Anyway, it's time to actually get the oil. Usually I prefer to get this done after about an hour instead of three, but I've been a little preoccupied. With maximum resource size, this one patch could probably supply an entire mega base, so pumping the entire field is definitely overkill. But something just feels wrong not covering it all in pump jacks. It's close enough that I could bring it all back with just pipes instead of a train, but considering my biter problems, I'd rather not my entire oil supply get cut off because of a single hungry biter. I'll also be defending it with flamethrowers, and I don't mean to keep bringing them up, but I wanted a nice vacation from Death Worlds, and this is what I got instead. More motivation to get to the end game, I suppose. Alright, I've got oil, now it's time to refine it. I don't know why I built so many of these, but at least I won't have oil problems. It's all set up for light oil and heavy oil once I research that, but right now I've got petroleum gas. Apparently a lot of people get confused at oil processing, so I'll let you in on the secret. You're supposed to connect the fluid outputs to the fluid inputs. Regardless, with some coal I've got plastic, and that means I can make some advanced circuits. My existing circuit build isn't enough, however, so I just build more. Funny how that works. You'll always need about twice as many advanced circuits as you build for, so even with a base this small, we'll still need quite a few assemblers. One of these days, biters. Alright, we've got advanced circuits, so now we need some engine units, which I'll just shove right here, using the same design as the advanced circuits. Then it's time to make some sulfur out of the petroleum, and that's everything we'll need for chemical science. My base isn't going to be winning any awards, especially not after what I had to do to route it into the labs, but it gets the job done, and now I've got access to the most useful technologies. Also, I'm finally defending my oil field. I'm putting the flamethrowers so far back because this way their fragile pipes supplying the fuel will be out of range of the spitters. It does mean the walls will take more heat, but I'd rather lose walls than need to replace undergrounds every two minutes. Okay, I really hate these biters, so instead of rushing bots like I normally do, I'm making a tank first. And that includes making the explosives I'll need to craft the cannon shells. 
I'm so excited to make these, I set them up before the research is even finished. And while they're crafting, I spend the time to upgrade all the belts and furnaces, effectively doubling my iron output. Alright, that should be enough. And you can see by the corpses how much fun I've been having. And that's because the biters decided to expand back into the thick smog I'd previously cleared out, so now we'll just need to unexpand them. It's pretty easy in a tank, and... Okay, see what happens when I leave one corner undefended by turrets? Default biters are mostly annoying because they're not enough of a problem to justify building a massive defensive wall, but they're annoying enough that you can't just ignore them. Well, they managed to temporarily delay their demise, but as soon as that's taken care of, it's right back into the tank, along with some rocket fuel this time. The tank has terrible acceleration, so making some early rocket fuel just for driving is always smart. You know, biters, maybe if you just learned to appreciate pollution as much as me, things wouldn't have ended up this way. After driving around for several minutes blowing up nests, I can confirm for the third time that yes, this is completely desert. But we've actually found some trees up here. Shocking. With all the nests within pollution range dead, everything should calm down for a while. And with it spread over this many tiles, the pollution spread versus absorption should reach equilibrium soon. At least until I start adding even more pollution. Now it's time to make robots, and by the power of advanced oil refining, sulfuric acid, lubricant, batteries, and electronic engines combined, we create Captain Robot Frames. Yeah, I'm skipping over a lot of this, but I've got a machine to explain. That'll give me access to construction robots, and while I'm at it, I'll set up some solar. Solar energy is a good bridge power until you can get to nuclear reactors. Then I set up some oil cracking so I don't overflow and lighten heavy oil, and make some dirty processing units so I can actually make some power armor. There we are, armor full of bots, and roboports fully automated so I can expand my network whenever I want. And here's cliff explosives, I guess. Hooray! This is why bots are so powerful. Even though they're really slow right now, I can just keep stamping down solar blueprints every time I start running low on power, and they'll do all the work for me. So it's been about six hours, but I've finally got some quiet time away from the biters, so maybe I can actually get some real progress going. You know what, might as well try to get the achievement for beating the game in under eight hours. I'll need a bunch more copper for that, so here's another copper stack. Again, once you get over the fear of just building more furnaces, the game really opens up. If I'm going to be making processing units, I'll need even more green circuits, so I've got the iron from that other stack running up here to make some more. The main purpose of the new copper is making low-density structures, which take 20 plates each, as well as a bunch of steel and plastic. You'll also want to make way more assemblers for these than you think you'll need. I'll be making some more red circuits too, which I can simply copy and paste thanks to my bots. Merge that with the leftovers from chemical science, and we've got a start. The only thing I'm missing for yellow science at this point are the processing units, and they just take those circuits we just made, as well as some sulfuric acid. Good rule of thumb is that for every processing unit assembler, you'll need one green circuit assembler working constantly to support it. But with all that, we can squeeze in the utility science. My spaghetti is growing out of control and I can't even fit it into all the labs, but it's good enough. Now it's time for purple science, and that means bringing my stone and bricks from all the way down there to all the way up here. Hail to the almighty underground belt, the great enabler of spaghetti. Purple science can be intimidating, but like everything in life, once you already know how to do it, it's pretty easy. So just learn that first and you're pretty much done. Stay tuned for more cool dosh tips. Mostly it's because of the rails and the furnace ingredients, but the real reason is most people never make enough steel or advanced circuits. Purple science alone nearly quadruples your steel demand. But now that's done and we can put our grape juice along with the piss bottles and that's all the main sciences completed. Not bad for 50 minutes, but of course that's about how long it takes speedrunners to beat the whole game. You can thank the biters for this mess, but bases like this are some of my favorite. Just sheer chaos, yet perfectly functional. Well, maybe not perfectly, but it definitely gets the job done. To actually make the rocket, I'll need rocket fuel, and my oil supply is quite literally infinite, so this is basically free. I'll also need some concrete to make the rocket silo, and that can be achieved like so. If I'm going to be using all of the sciences at once, I'll need more steel, so here it is. Rocket control units are actually pretty simple, it's just all three circuits combined. But the reason they're scary is because processing units are so expensive compared to everything else, and so it's rare that you'll actually make a starting base capable of mass producing them. At this point all I'm missing is the actual rocket silo research. My base doesn't really produce enough circuits to support everything, and while I could add more iron and copper to make more circuits, I'd rather just stand here. Well, there's the rocket silo research, so now it's time to build the rocket. 
That means combining 1,000 units of our fuel, rocket control units, and LDSs. At least it would be that many if I hadn't handcrafted four Tier 3 productivity modules, which makes it more like 700. As expected, I'm bottlenecked by RCUs, and unfortunately I didn't quite make the 8 hour mark, but hey, considering I only started caring about 2 hours ago and spent half of that time AFK, I'll consider that a win. Anyway, this was all completely pointless, because this run is about getting to the end of the world, and launching a rocket here achieved absolutely nothing. This base is nice and all, but it's nowhere near what we'll need to supply our expedition, so it's time to make the real base. That all starts with these modules, but while that works, I've given the biters plenty of time to expand back into my cloud, so it's time for another round of extermination. If you're wondering about all the circles, it's a somewhat cheaty debug option that you can use to find where enemy bases have expanded to without needing to see them first. Alright, thanks to those modules, I've now got power armor, which can fit way more personal robots and exoskeletons. I've also finally researched requester chests and added Logibots to the network, in addition to adding tons of personal logistics filters in preparation for the long build ahead of me. And every big base needs big resources, and so for the first time I'll be expanding away from my starter patch. It's always exciting when you get to set up your first proper rail system. Making one big loop will give me a good basis to branch off these little train estuaries to reach the patches. I'm going for a reasonably large base here, so I'll plan for a 2-8 train design. These ore patches are absolutely massive, just one has over a hundred million ores in it, so running out is not an issue. Instead, the limiting factor is just how many miners I can fit onto it, so here's the super compact way to set up your mines. I can also blueprint it and snap it all to grid, so all I need to do is drag the blueprint around to build the whole thing. That's given me a perfect eight lanes, but I'll still want to balance it before loading it onto the trains. And there it is, the beautiful beginning of our base. Maybe in 12 hours I'll actually be able to use it, but for now I've got to set up the other resources. What I can also do is blueprint this design and use it for setting up all the other resources, like for this copper patch over here. Once again, smear that mining blueprint all over it, and in no time I've got another mine set up and ready to go. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that watching mining outposts turn on for the first time is up there on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now I've done the same thing for stone. And coal as well. That's everything, except for the oil, of course. Again, these oil fields are so absurdly rich that no matter how big my base is, I'll never need more than just this one stop, so I've set it up for high throughput. And remember when I said the biters are mostly just annoying? Well, I've got all the resources ready, so it's time to bring them all to some forges. For the throughput I'm looking for, I'm going to want a pretty large waiting bay, and that's because I'm going to be unloading from both sides at once to create 16 lanes of ore altogether. That means at maximum throughput, it'll only take about 20 seconds to completely empty a filled train. So again, throughput is important. That's why I'm going to be copying this entire design for the copper and steel forges as well, complete with their own waiting bays. This is going to take a ton of belts, and I've just about lost my patience with these biters. That's why I've now researched the Spider-Tron. This will be a good distraction while I wait for more belts and supplies to show up, but I've got to make tier 3 efficiency modules first. And while those work, I'll be making explosive rockets. Making Spider-Trons and all their equipment with a base this week is a little painful, but it'll all be worth it. Not many people realize the true power of Spider-Trons, but that's what I'm here to demonstrate. I can fill their equipment with bots so they can repair themselves remotely, and give them their own logistics requests so Logibots will automatically refill them with rockets. We can make one follow the other, and now we can just point it at any nest on the map and wait for it to die. I cannot tell you how good this feels after everything I've been through. Now I can simply click on any nests that expand into my pollution and make it go away remotely without needing to step away from building. You can even queue up commands and make them clear out the entire perimeter. Alright, now I can build the real base, and that starts with the forges. This is a build that will spit out an entire blue belt of plates with only 14 furnaces. Or at least it will once I've completely filled it up with tier 3 modules, but that's quite a ways away. As you might expect, these take tons of belts, and so that's why I've set up the iron first. It might only be able to spit out about a fourth of what it could manage at its final form, but that's still way more than our old base. Oh, and uh, here's me mining uranium, because it's better to set it up early so we'll have enough to set up Covrex for nuclear power later. These solar panels are nowhere near enough to even run the forges as they are, let alone fully beaconed and moduled. 
Back to business, it'll be a while before I'm ready to build the main bus, so I might as well make use of all that iron and turn it into belts with this temporary build. That'll work while I finish up copper, steel, oil, bricks, and all that good stuff. Spiders occasionally build new nests and expand, but you can actually stop them from expanding altogether. Not by using cheats or anything, all you need to do is kill every nest on the map. Because of how the game handles map generation, as long as I don't create more nests by generating new chunks, they won't be able to expand simply because no nests exist. However, if pollution touches a chunk, it will generate it, and chunks are also generated a certain radius around the player, so you'll need to do this with artillery or remote-controlled spider-trons. But the result is, as long as my pollution remains in this area, I won't need to worry about biters at all anymore. Obviously, I'll be making more pollution eventually, but it means I can build in peace until then, which I'll be using to my great advantage by spending two hours designing this modular nuclear reactor. I'm going to need tons of power, and while it might be easy to forget, I'll be taking this all the way to the end of the world, so an easily expandable setup is a must. Most late-game reactor setups are designed to be pasted over water, so you don't need to deal with the hassle of hooking up the absurd amount of water that they require, and this one's no different. Because reactors get a neighbor bonus for every other reactor it's touching, I can just keep expanding this design by pasting them in series to get the maximum efficiency possible. This design has some room for improvement, but it should work just fine. And after all that, I've got quite a few belts to finish the forges. Here's copper. And here's steel. Last thing is stone, but there's no way I'll need 16 belts of this, so it's much smaller than the others. Stay with me, alright? I swear we're getting to the point of all this. Anyway, the only raw ingredient I'm missing now are all the oil products. This refinery is designed for beacons, and while it might not be the most efficient design beacon-wise, it just means I'll need to spend some extra time making modules. This much refining is going to need a bunch of cracking to deal with all the excess oils, and with this design, I'll be able to maximize beacon coverage so that each chemical plant will have 8 beacons affecting it. Getting the fluids where they need to be is the real challenge, especially given the massive amounts of water that these things will drink. But after all that, here's our basic oil refining. I've already brought the coal in because the most important oil product are the plastic bars. You'll need tons of these for all the circuits required to sustain infinite research. Yeah, the main point of making a base this big is so I have enough of a science supply to ensure that I can get a good number of infinite researches finished, but more on that later. Again, everything is built with beacons in mind, and then I'll build the sulfur. I don't need nearly this many just for science, but my plans involve more than simple research, so it doesn't hurt to overbuild. Okay, these trains are just stuck together. That's a lesson learned in trying to hot-swap rail signals. Basically, while I'm here, I'm trying to just knock out everything oil-related, and that includes sulfuric acid and the batteries. I'll put the iron and copper plates they require in later, it's just trying to get it out of the way. And I'm skipping all the way ahead to making the rocket fuel, even though the rocket is the last thing I'll build. It's just nice to have everything planned out ahead of time. The absolute last thing I'll need is the lubricant, and with that the oil zone is finished. Shoutouts to Rygard and his pipe visualizer mod for making this incomprehensible mess of pipes comprehensible. Oof, it's crazy how I can skip over hours of effort in a couple seconds and still feel like I'm going too slow, but moving on. It's time to say goodbye to the temporary built build and set up the beginnings of the main bus. And yeah, it's a big bus. It's like a quadruple decker bus. This is about as big as I'd consider building with a bus design, but I feel like I've got to give the people what they want, and what they want is a massive river of iron plates. To actually get the resources through, I need to use a ton of undergrounds, but this will go up to make the acid and the batteries. Keeping all of the biters in their quantum states is quite a chore, but definitely preferable to the alternative. As usual, green circuits are first, which represent the bulk of all your resource demands. Keeping with the furnaces and oil refining, I'm going to design everything to have 8 beacons affecting each assembler. When you factor in productivity modules, the designs get a bit more complicated, because if you're consuming an entire belt of iron, you're going to be outputting an entire belt of circuits plus another 40% extra due to productivity bonuses, so you've got to plan your throughput carefully. With a bus this big, just getting the resources to the assemblers is almost as complicated as making the design itself. Seriously, you can never have too many circuits, and when this thing's all beaconed up, it'll spit out nearly 500 circuits a second. Considering you've seen me make all this stuff once already, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you can see the differences in philosophy between making designs meant to beat the game and designs meant to make infinite research. 
That being said, these designs aren't the most optimal. I'm sticking with 8 beacon setups in series, but when you get down to it, anything under 12 beacons is technically suboptimal. Even so, I like making different designs, and the complications of trying to fit 8 beacons around every build was interesting. Seeing as I've only got two tiles of space to work with between the assemblers and the beacons, I had to get a little creative and route things in between. Now when pulling off of the bus, I'm trying to alternate which lanes I'm using so that I won't need to rebalance it too much. But with that, that's all the circuits. When you're making your real base, you should always make the circuits first. Not only because they're the most important resource, but because you can set up module production right away. Any other run, I'd be gushing about how clean this module setup is, but suffice to say, it turns all of our circuits into the coveted Tier 3 speed and productivity modules that will need to unlock this base's true potential. Now onto all the science ingredients. While I build these, modules will be slowly accumulating, but keyword on slowly, because just one Tier 3 takes 2,000 copper plates and 1,000 iron plates, and we're going to need thousands. Because the productivity bonus is compounding with each step, a factory filled entirely with productivity modules will make nearly three times as much science from the same amount of materials as one without. There's chemical science out of the way, and I'll do yellow next. The robot frames are a little annoying, because like the processing units, I have to insert fluids, which means I can't share beacons with the build above. But at least it gives me an excuse to add more roboports. Seriously, coming back to vanilla after playing modded Factorio, wider area roboports are probably the things I miss the most. I've got some modules, so now I can show you just how big of a difference they make. It's going to take 20, maybe 30 hours before I'll have enough modules to fill the entire base, but the more I speed up my production, the faster it'll make me modules. So even though it's only making 2 every minute right now, it'll probably end up making 10 times that amount when everything's finished. Then I suddenly remember that I'm building a real base and I haven't even set up concrete yet. Naturally, I rectify that immediately, because as everyone knows, if it doesn't have concrete and lamps, it's not a real base. Now for low density structures. The good news is I've built enough that I can start reusing designs. It's always satisfying when you can start slamming down massive designs like this with no effort. And we're going to need to gather tons of these because they're used to make yellow science and rockets, which will be launching in the thousands. There's yellow science, so next up is purple science. I usually like to get the complicated ones out of the way first, and this one was definitely the most challenging to build within the arbitrary constraints that I set for myself. Mostly because of the rails. You need 30 for each recipe, and when you're using tons of speed beacons, you'll very quickly reach the throughput limitations of a single blue belt, so I had to find a way to fit it all in my limited space. And that includes cursed belt weaving, as well as running all of the rail supplies above. But it works. That's all the difficult ones out of the way, but I'll make RCUs next. With these, I'll have technically completed the rocket, but I'm still going to build the silos last. Proper late-game military science builds are rare to see, but it's not something that I can ignore, and that's because the master plan involves a good deal of infinite military research. It's easy enough, and you can see what I mean about pollution spawning more biters. That's the downside of actually having the factory running to make modules, and the desert is never-ending. There's only two sciences left, and they're the easiest. The good thing about green science is because it only has two inputs, I don't need to worry about leaving space between the assemblers to fit undergrounds. And red science is the easiest thing in the entire world. So there it is. I'm still trying to fill everything with modules, but you can see the sheer number of beacons I've got to fill. It's going to be a while. Okay, the actual last science is space science, and it's something most people don't ever bother with, but for us it is absolutely necessary to do what we're about to do. Okay, maybe not necessary, but it's certainly going to make it much easier. To get space science, we simply build a rocket like we did before, except this time you put a satellite into it to get 1,000 science packs per launch. It is by far the most expensive science and necessary for all infinite research. It takes all this stuff like solar panels and accumulators, and we'll load it like so. I could have gotten away with one silo if I completely surrounded it with beacons, but I simply wanted two rockets. And the concreting has begun. It's really starting to look like a proper base now, even if it is still waiting for tons of modules. Also, here's even more power. So satisfying. As much as I'd like to start researching things right away, I still have lots to do, and that's because I'm starting to reach the limits of being able to simply kill all the nests within my pollution.
The nests are getting massive and my pollution is spreading way too fast, so I'd rather not turn the base on completely yet. I'll also need some more resources, because unsurprisingly, if I'm unloading 16 blue belts at the forges and only loading 8 reds at a time, I'm gonna need to increase throughput. Still satisfying to watch, though. Now I'm gonna set up an actual bot mall. Although my base might not be at 100% yet, it still makes more than enough resources to craft whatever I want. And I've talked about setting these up in pretty much every video I've ever made, so we're skipping that. The important thing is, I can also automate Spidertron and Spidertron equipment production. So you know when I said that people don't understand the true power of Spidertrons earlier? I'll bet you thought I was talking about remote-controlled biter destruction, but nope. This is the true power of the Spidertrons. If you give them their own robots and logistics requests, the Logibots will automatically fill their inventory with those items whenever they're in range of the logistics network. Basically, you can turn them into mobile construction facilities, and if you make an entire fleet of them, you can build quite a lot, all without needing to walk there yourself. Now it's finally time to make the labs. Even a base this big won't make a full belt of science, so I can combine them into one belt. And with the strategic use of undergrounds and long-handed inserters, I can fill the labs from four belts. This base will make about 900 signs per minute, and that should be enough to get me all of the research I'll need. Just look at how fast it finishes research. The perimeter wall is finished, and now that I don't need to worry about biters breaking everything, I'm finally comfortable enough to say that this base is finished. For those of you that wanted a completely normal playthrough, here you are. Only now, after 45 hours, can I begin to worry about the actual point to all of this. But let's take some time to appreciate what we've built first. Alright, appreciation over, now it's time to get down to business. Basically, I'm just gonna build a big tube. There's a lot of different designs I had to consider to get to the end of the world. The main challenges are the biters. And at first I considered some sort of temporary laser setup that would get deconstructed once it's done, but then I remembered that I've got expansions on and new nests can spawn behemoth worms that would wreck my build from outside the range of any turrets, so artillery is a must. The downside is that they're slow, expensive, and will clear way more area than I actually need, but there's no avoiding it. The second consideration is how to actually get the supplies to the end of the tube when it's going to be hundreds of kilometers long. Because I'll be punching through massive nests and behemoth biters, defense isn't something I can skimp out on. I'll need to build some resilient designs involving walls and turrets, but that massively increases the item demands. The first possibility I considered was some robot bucket brigade where Logibots would bring items from network to network in a big line. As long as there's an uninterrupted supply, it wouldn't matter how long it took to get there, and that seemed the best idea until I realized the literal terawatts required to move items that far with robots, so I scrapped the idea. The next possibility was simply belts, but that would require tons of different belts carrying lots of different things and several inserters to push them into provider chests so the bots can actually use them. That would increase the width substantially, and the throughput of inserters would limit how fast I could build each section. Using a massive sushi belt could theoretically solve that, but the difficulties of getting exactly what I needed to build each section would be a nightmare. So belt seemed a potential solution, but considering my own run-ins with belt lag in the past, I was hesitant. And that's what finally led me to trains. At first, trains seemed like they would be terrible to work with, but each section requires the same amount of materials every time, so preloaded trains could be a solution. However, getting the trains back would be awful, because remember, this ride is going to be three hours long. Then there's the need to actually unload them. I could cycle hundreds of trains continuously to eat the travel time, but adding a massive switchback loop to the design was less than ideal for defensive reasons. And that's when I had the epiphany. Why should I need to bring them back? I could just deconstruct the trains, and then the bots would automatically shove anything inside into storage. No inserters, no return route, it's perfect. And so I've decided to dub this the Sacrificial Trains design. The actual trains only have the same stop twice in their schedules, so that they'll always try to go to the next one in series no matter what, and that way I'll be able to make a massive conga line with each train carrying the supplies to build exactly one section. The actual design of the tube I've decided will be 100 units long for each section. It's a good even number within the range of artillery, so it's guaranteed to be safe, and it's a good compromise between length and convenience for construction robots. Those little guys are going to be building this whole thing, so it's best not to stress them out too much. 
Now, this thing needs to be capable of going over land and sea, and that means I'll need to include landfill to the building process. I'm sure you'll all be laughing at me when the expansion comes out and you can just blueprint over water, but unless landfill is finished, pasting the blueprint over water would do absolutely nothing, which would be catastrophic if I'm trying to make this thing fully automatic. Which I am. Because of that, I'll need to make the construction in parts to ensure the landfill is placed first. And because even 100 tiles is smaller than the area of a single roboport, I'll need to landfill, place the roboports, landfill again, and then place even more roboports to cover the whole area. Only after that can I confidently place all the other parts. To actually paste the blueprints, I'll need the help of the Recursive Blueprints mod. And what that'll allow me to do is shove a blueprint into a chest and paste it anywhere on the map by sending in a building signal and coordinates into the chest. The actual construction of this thing is simple in theory, but incredibly convoluted in practice. Essentially, it's a bunch of state machines, with each state representing one phase of the building process. Knowing when a blueprint is finished being built is incredibly important. The only way I can know is to read the network status via signals and read the number of bots total and the number of bots that are available in that network. I'll paste a blueprint and lock the machine into that state until the number of available bots equals the total, and that will indicate that it's finished. Then we'll enter the next state and repeat until the whole thing is built. Again, simple, but pretty convoluted with all the separate blueprints required. Especially after needing to make all the blueprints line up properly. And any edit I want to make to the blueprints while designing is extremely time-consuming. You'll notice that there are belts, and I've decided to deliver the artillery shells by belt as well as construction robots. Artillery shells are terrible to transport by wagon, and it's impossible to know just how many I'll need for each build, so belts solve both those things. The construction bots are so that even a completely dead network can be revived with just an inserter into the roboport. If something goes wrong 500,000 tiles down the line, I won't be able to save it manually, so contingencies are very good here. Probably the most important thing I realized during my testing was the importance of managing the construction bot's travel. Every section has its own storage chests, and that's where all the supplies from the train will be unloaded to. Naturally, you'll want all the supplies to be as close to the start of the next section as possible to build faster and spend less time recharging. But because of how bots work, they'll try to concentrate items in chests that already contain that item. Good for normal play, but really bad here. However, in the main blueprint, I can include these chests that will paste over the chests of the previous build. You can add filters to storage chests, and if I set the filter to something that they'll never encounter, the bots won't try to store new stuff there. That way, only the front-facing chests will be available to store new things, but any items already in the previous chests can still be accessed. I cannot stress enough just how important this one feature is. It will easily save hundreds of hours alone. The next problem is how to know when it's safe to build. There's biters after all, and they don't take kindly to being hit with artillery. I can't have the bots losing supplies by building them into incoming attacks, so I need to know when it's safe, and I can accomplish that with a timer. When the blueprint for the artillery is placed, it starts a counter. And this is the clever part. Just like the roboports, I can read signals from along the electrical wires back at the base, and by reading the hands of the inserters, I can tell when a shell is loaded. Whenever a shell is loaded, it will reset the counter back to zero, so that the attack it provokes has time to die before the next build command is given. That does include the complication that I'll only want to read the signals from the active section, but I can solve this by bridging the signals along a medium power pole. And when building the new section, I can use a filtered deconstruction planner to only remove the medium poles from the previous section, thus severing the connection so that artillery from a previous section won't trip the timer. The last step is unloading the train in preparation to build to the next section. You can see it in action, and just look at how efficiently the robots pack it all away, only for the next train in sequence to take its place, all ready for the next section. That's the main loop, and the final step is to check if both the construction loop is finished and the artillery timer has reached 50 seconds. If that's the case, then decrement a memory cell by 100 to update the coordinates of where to place the blueprints and start the process all over again. And then repeat that 10,000 times. Then I add on some finishing touches, like a timer, so I can keep track of how long each section took to build, and then store that in some almighty shift registers to show the rolling average of the last 10 sections, and use that to estimate the time left to reach the end given the current rated position. <coughs> I also added an alarm system for error handling. Absolutely beautiful. But now I need to build it in my actual base. I can't just jump into it though, because I still need to finish up some preparations. Chiefly amongst them is actually making the artillery shells. I'll need tons of these things, and so I'll need to make a lot of explosives as well. I can confidently say that I've never made this many artillery shells in my entire life, but we'll need them where we're going.
After all that, it's finally time to start pasting the blueprints. I clean it up a bit and make it more presentable, and voila! I've also added a display for the current position. With our roughly 1k signs per minute, I'll be researching tons of things like artillery shooting speed. I don't want artillery range because that would make it clear even more nests that aren't in the way. I'll also want loads of damage research for my turrets, and by far the most important one is worker robot speed. The faster they move, the faster they'll build, and the less they'll need to recharge. It should go without saying, but building the sections faster is good. Keep in mind that even shaving off a single second on average will save me nearly three hours across the whole build. I forgot to record actually doing it, but the amount of walls and landfill I need is insane. So I've set up a stone mine that does nothing but that. It's crazy that I've made a dedicated train for walls in vanilla and it actually has a purpose. Each section needs 550 walls and 900 landfill, so the throughput is actually important. Okay, so I was feeling confident and felt like I was almost done, only to realize that I'd completely glossed over how to actually load the train. I thought it would be simple, but it turns out that it's far more complicated than I expected. And that's because, to place the trains autonomously, they need to be set to automatic mode so that they'll head to the stations without me needing to turn them on. However, you can't actually load an automatic train unless it's stopped at a station. And that's problematic, because again, for it to be totally autonomous, it needs to have those two stops and only those two stops. Which don't involve a lot of standing still. I can't change the schedule using circuits, and I can't set it to automatic using circuits, so I'm stuck. However, you can load wagons if the train is set to manual, or if there's just no locomotive at all. Remember my beltless video? Well, if I place only the wagons, then I'll be able to load them normally. Then once it's done, I can actually paste a locomotive blueprint on top of it, and it will automatically attach, taking the wagons with it. Just like the beltless video, I can set filters to the wagon's inventory so only certain items can fit, and that way I'll be able to make sure that there's room for all 30-something items that each section requires. There's one problem, though, and that's the fact that the inserters will try to fill the slots completely. I don't know about you, but sending 50 radars to each section when they only require one each seems a little wasteful. Even if I wanted to be lazy, my base just isn't big enough to waste that many resources, and it would also increase unloading times, thus increasing build time significantly. So I want to put in only what I need, but there's no way to read the contents of the wagon to tell the inserters to stop. I could do that if it was stopped at a station, but guess what we can't do? So my only option is to create this massive mess that reads whatever the inserters picked up and push that into a memory cell, compare that with the values I want, and then release the train once every value exceeds the limit before finally resetting the memory cell. And that's what I had to go through to make the trains build autonomously. There's a lot of tweaks I had to do to the combinators, and I don't want to talk about them. Ugh, what's important is I can finally try to turn the machine on. One interesting consideration is that from all the combat testing, I realize that the artillery cannons clear nests chunk by chunk in a clockwise spiral, and that by building it so that the range isn't stuck between two chunks at the edge, I can prevent a full rotation if there's nests there. Just another observation that could potentially save me hours. To start, I'll build the first section manually. I'll also need to hook up the oil for the flamethrowers to my main supply. I can only imagine the sheer amounts of oil that'll pass through these pipes. The last thing before I can get started are the construction bots on belts. I shouldn't need too many of these, as the network will usually maintain its numbers. Okay, the real last thing I need is way more steel, because as it turns out, making 50 billion laser turrets, flamethrowers, and artillery takes tons of steel, so pretty much all of this is going to be consumed by my supply network to fill the trains. But here we go. And, sure enough, it pastes in the proper place, perfectly slotting into the previous section. And there it goes over water! It's like I know what I'm doing or something! And every time it goes through a cycle, new wagons are pasted down to be loaded and sent off to begin their long, arduous journey. Although, not so long just yet. It goes for a while, but then I realized that since I designed this in a sterile environment, I failed to take trees into consideration, and so I'll need to adjust the storage chests and add another deconstruction planner to clear out all the natural stuff. Building into a forest fire would have disastrous consequences. I've also added on a module that will deconstruct roboports every 10 sections to sever that network from the active one. Otherwise, if biters attack wall 10 kilometers down the line, robots from the active section would try and fly to fix it, only to stop the whole thing from ever progressing because it's counted as an active bot and my machine would assume the blueprint was never finished. 
Seeing as the train needs to stop for one second at every station, the time it takes for each train to actually reach the end is a concern, and so I'll be adding another lane and multi-thread my train deployment. That way it will replace the train that was deleted and then fill that new space with a new train, ensuring that the tube will always be filled with trains. More on the alarm system, it's actually quite sophisticated. Right now what I'm doing is making a bunch of conditions that will check the status of items in the logistics network and set an alert if any of them run out, and then send that signal to the alarm. How it works is that it captures signals into a memory cell and then uses that to not only activate the alarm, but display a specific alert for which kind of problem occurred. Seeing as I'm going to leave this in the background, these kinds of safety measures are absolutely necessary for debugging issues which might have occurred an hour ago while I wasn't looking. The most important feature is that whenever the alarm status is active, it blocks the construction loop so that the machine won't keep going and going even when it's broken. I love how robustly I've had to design this thing. It's almost like the engineers who built Mars rovers and the like. Since, you know, it'd better work, because it's not like you're going to be able to go up there and fix it. And then I get one of those alerts just now. And it's quite something, alright. <sighs> okay, so remember when I explained chunk generation? Well, the bots aren't capable of spawning new chunks on their own, and so the blueprint gets pasted into the void and chopped off with no way to recover. This took me completely by surprise, because I'd never tried to build into an undiscovered area before. Radars can spawn chunks, but they can only reveal 96 tiles in front of them, not 100, so moving it to the very end just barely isn't enough. I could solve this by simply forcing someone to ride a train in front to make the game generate new chunks around them, or I could also add multiple radars to the first steps of building, but after 50 hours making my base just to get this far and another 20 hours designing this thing, I chose the lamest option, and I modded the radars to have one extra chunk of vision. Yeah, yeah, I was just a little impatient after getting blindsided like that. I also took the opportunity to remove the radar's ability to scan new chunks, cause all it would do is spawn more biters, increase file size, and consume even more RAM. Keeping hundreds of thousands of chunks in memory is no joke, and I'd prefer if I didn't run out before reaching the end. However, with that taken care of, it's free to extend. And would you look at that, it's already 4,000 tiles long. What's that, 0.4% of the way there? And you'll see that it's taking about 2 minutes per section. At this rate, the machine tells me that it'll be over 13 days before it's finished, so, uh, time to get comfortable. Or not. So there were some growing pains for my base, where my backlog of supplies were slowly being drained away, and only after a couple hours did it become apparent that I wasn't making enough. I'm not showing all of them, but here the entire machine is broken because of a concrete shortage. So I might question why I decided to use concrete at all, because it's tons of effort and additional time for zero practical benefit. And to those people, the uh, shut up. It's about sending a message. Realistically though, since I'll be usually waiting on the artillery timer, it shouldn't slow down the process too much. Then I've got a shortage of nuclear fuel of all things, and I'm pretty sure that this will be enough for me to never need to worry about it again. The biggest shortage was express underground belts, and that's because they take about 260 iron plates to make, and each section needs about 50 of them. I used mainly undergrounds because they can cover 10 tiles with the bots only needing to place 2 of them, so it speeds up the first build significantly. Because the artillery are the main cause of delays, the sooner I get the shells to them, the sooner each section will finish. But it seems to be working now, so it's time for some nice and relaxing montages. So once again, I'm heading back due to an alarm. And it's the concrete again. I will not compromise on the concrete, okay? It is 100% necessary. I just love how you can see the build tab of the statistics menu, and it looks more like the production graph. I have never seen anything like this. And as you can see, we're building about 230 walls per minute. I am just in love with this thing. Nothing can stop it. Not land, not sea. It just slowly advances. I mean, imagine being a biter and seeing this thing slowly approaching you at 20 minutes per kilometer. For reference, 1,000 kilometers is about the distance between the capitals of France and Spain, so it's not surprising my estimations put this build around 13 to 14 days. It was actually working so well, I invited some of my investors to come and watch it before the file size entered the gigabytes and the RAM usage went through the roof. It already takes like 10 seconds to save, and that's after I upgraded to an NVMe SSD. 
performance is going to be a major concern, and I have no idea if this thing's going to actually be able to make it to the end before my computer explodes, but one way to find out. That was my biggest fear making this thing, that I'd get like halfway there and the lag would simply become unbearable. So while we were all out on the edge watching the biters explode, my trains had mysteriously deadlocked for the first time in this 60 hour run. And let me tell you, seeing the belts all empty like this is almost eerie. The worst part is, I knew what was coming next, and that would be the alarm yelling at me that the flow of supplies had stopped. Well, I resolved that issue, and it's back to waiting. So this is it. Not much to do, but stand here. Just kidding. If you expected all of this to just work, clearly you've never watched one of my videos. It's pretty much inevitable that something like this would fail in some unforeseeable way, and this machine has been kind enough to provide me with a wealth of content to really spice up these next million meters. Unfortunately, it's impossible to really catch these things in the wild, because at this point, Factorio is running completely in the background, and all I can do is react when it breaks. And it's not like I'm recording all 300 hours of me standing in one spot, but I've done my best to hit record when something interesting happens. The first thing I can mention is that there is no amount of testing that could prepare me for the freak combinations of biters and terrain. The 50 second timer I set works almost all the time, but even if it's a 1 in 1000 chance, that still means it's going to happen 10 times before I'm finished. And sometimes the biters will get stuck in trees and get massively delayed so that they attack right when the new section is being built. That wouldn't be so bad if not for the other chance that they might attack from the front and cause the flamethrowers to leave fire and blow up the underground belts, only for the bots to replace them again and again until they run out. Fortunately, there will always be a few spares in the network before they got severed, so it usually wasn't enough to halt the building, but it did stop a few times because of that. This next issue is the one that drove me the closest to insanity. I don't have any video evidence of them, but I do have proof of what it did to my precious tube. First, I need to show you my trains. Here was the status of my train network three days in and one quarter of the way there. Yes, that is 2,000 trains. So, mixed in with those thousands of trains were these extremely rare mutant trains that somehow escaped the loader without being fully loaded. You can imagine the havoc that would wreak, because then it couldn't fully build the next section. And this was so rare, I never managed to catch it happening despite staring at it for 30 minutes. Who knows how many of my trains were infected, and all I could do was wait for them to reach the end and break. It took me far too long to realize what was breaking it too, since all of the evidence had been long since deconstructed. Anyway, I added on an extra module to the first station that reads the train's contents and compares it to the expected values and then throws an error if a mutant train passes through. Which led to this rather hilarious situation where I tabbed into the game after hearing the error and had to chase after this fleeing thing. Yeah, that's what you get. To make a long story short, the issue is with the memory cells. I caught it full of junk data before it got reset, and I thought it wasn't resetting properly at the end, but as it turns out, it was incorrectly resetting in the middle of the loading phase. And I still have no idea how, but I eventually fixed it. Like a hundred hours later. Suddenly being jolted to attention by hearing those alarms in the background was giving me flashbacks to my Factorio City video. It was around 10% of the way there that my fears had been realized, and I started running into performance issues. I stared at the usage data for a while, and after some experiments, I confirmed my suspicions that the laser turrets couldn't be the cause, but what surprised me was how much flamethrower turrets were responsible for. At this point, they were causing more lag than my actual base. I mean, I shouldn't be that surprised considering I had 22,000 of them, but still. It was clear that I had to make some adjustments. I had been prepared for this possibility, and the answer is to add on yet another module that deconstructs all the flamethrowers, then replaces the underground pipe so that fluid can still flow to the end. The laser turrets will be more than enough to fend off anything that happens to walk into it, so this is fine. It'll take a while to work through the 1000 sections I've already completed, but after that it'll trail behind the front end to do the replacements as soon as the robot networks are separated as to not perturb the main building process. Another source of lag were the aforementioned 2000 trains lined up in the tube, so I had to make the heartbreaking decision to cut them off. That'll be enough to get me another 20% of the way there, and so they'll be slowly whittled down across the next few days. Days later, once there were maybe 500 left in the tube, I turned them back on. Fuel was a concern, but now that so many had been completed, I could just delete all the extra train stations so the trains could just roll through at max speed right up to the front. Okay, this next error was something that I could have never predicted, and it's the only one I wasn't able to completely remove. Unfortunately, I don't have any video evidence of it, so you'll just have to take my word for it, but it causes things like this. So you know how I added in that process that periodically removes flamethrowers? 
Well, as it turns out, active blueprints in completely different networks can actually delay the deployment of bots in the main network. I've seen the bots just stay in their roboports for several seconds before finally deploying. That wouldn't be a problem in the normal game, but that's the only way I can detect if a blueprint was pasted. If the blueprint goes out and the lazy bots stay indoors, the machine just assumes the blueprint was finished because it sees that every bot is home and then it enters the next phase of building. If that happens over water, the whole thing will break because there's no land to build on, and if that happens while there's no train to deconstruct yet, they'll never get the supplies they need. It's extremely random and very difficult to account for. The best I could do was add a delay to the flamethrower deconstructor so that it doesn't happen while the main prints are going out, but it is truly insidious. It's not like I can just turn off the deconstruction step because of the lag it would cause, so I'll just need to deal with it. I was able to mitigate the effects by adding timers between each step so that they're given at least a second to deploy instead of the two frames they used to have, which helped, but it came with this terrible catch-22. I could theoretically remove the issue altogether if each step had at least four seconds, but that would massively slow down the building process. Ultimately, I decided that it would be fine with one second, and any more wouldn't be worth it. It's sounding like this machine is just one big mess of errors, but it'll go 10, 20 hours without complaint and then suddenly break. It's truly random, and so I've decided that dealing with these intermittent issues is better than slowing down the whole thing significantly. This issue was so prevalent, I had to add a special error state that detects when the build time was exactly 53 seconds, because that's how long it would take for a cycle if nothing was actually built and the artillery counter immediately ran down without ever being reset. Hey, and that's not the end. Obviously the deconstructor is the root of all my problems, but it becomes apparent that I need to be even more aggressive with it. Now the artillery turrets are lagging like crazy, and so I've got to make another process that deletes those as well as the inserters. I'd prefer to keep them around, but they've got to go. This sort of thing can happen when all the artillery are gone, but I've pretty much resigned myself to needing to fix this thing at least once a day, and so replacing it whenever an expansion appears isn't the worst. It's not as automatic as I'd hoped, but hey, what you gonna do? Even the pumps were beginning to contribute to the lag. And you'll never guess what I did. Yeah, I added something that deletes them, but because of how much this screws up the main build, I separated it from the main function and instead decided to control the process with this long belt acting as a timer. That way, I'll only let it do its thing when I'm available to fix it. Since it's just a lag reduction measure, it's not critical that it be up to date at all times. I was originally thinking I'd be able to do like a big montage of the display as it slowly approached 1 million, but nope, cavalcade of errors and bug fixes it is. The best errors are the ones where fixing it is more effort than dealing with it. Welcome to the world of Enterprise Software. I've got even more errors for your pleasure. Here's the trains never departing because of a single damaged pipe making its way into the network and blocking the slot from ever being filled. And here's when there were so many trees that every bot was stuck carrying wood before one ever managed to place a storage chest. Here's the most bizarre error of them all. It took me so long to realize that it was broken because this one substation was somehow placed one tile off and the very important signals from the roboport weren't making their way back to the main base. I have absolutely no idea how this could happen and it's been fine 9,999 times, but I've learned to stop asking questions. The worst one was near the end where I unhooked the alarm like an idiot and came back an hour later to see 53s across the board, so who knows how far off the position was. This is exactly why I made the machine stop for any error, but I was able to recover it by pasting this random blueprint and honing in on the correct value when the ghost appeared. So then I could adjust the position manually until it was back to where it needed to be. And then very pointedly reattach the wire to the alarm. My absolute favorite problem was the burst of lag whenever the bots placed belts towards the end. Like, it's fine when it's just one million belts long, but something about adding a new section probably forces it to recalculate the position or something of the literal million artillery shells and bots on the line. I love how between this and the sushi video, I've probably found all of the ways to ruin the beautiful belt optimization the devs work so hard on. We're almost there, and there's one more screw-up, and it was the worst one by far. It was absolutely my fault. I had a safety measure added to the train yard that stopped new trains from being pasted if there was already a train inside. But then the left train got stuck in a bizarre state and could never leave, and that ended up blocking the right lane as well. That meant for nearly 20 hours, no trains were being deployed, and finally the entire backlog ran dry. This was the worst, because now it was over three hours before I could get any new trains to the front. It at least gave me an excuse to delete even more useless train stops, but that's quite the delay. Watching this is like a preview of my own trip to the edge. But there you are, everything interesting that happened to me in the last 14 days. Or at least the stuff I remembered to record. 
It actually feels unreal that I've made it this far. It seems like just yesterday that the time remaining and the time elapsed were reversed. It felt like I was never gonna get there, but here we are, the final stretch at long last. Uh, it seems that it's reached the end, but let's just pretend I didn't forget to adjust the starting position to account for the fact that we didn't start at the perfect center. There, exactly one million, and now there's only one thing left to do. Okay, for all my lag-reducing measures, I'm like right at the limits of my CPU, and I'd prefer if my FPS didn't jitter as I recorded my triumphant journey to the end, so I'll be deleting all of these. And using a cheat to delete all the radars on the map. My footage needs to be flawless, dammit. But without further delays, here it is. The three-hour train ride to the end of the world. Enjoy! By the way, playing this map requires 14 gigabytes of RAM. If for some reason you want this map, it'll be available on my Patreon. All 800 megabytes of it. Oh my god, it, it it's true! Woob has been playing us for fools! Factorio doesn't take place on a planet, it's just a giant square in a void! Well, before I'm overcome by existential terror, let's appreciate this iron patch with 200 billion ore in it. Conservative estimate, you're looking at around 20 years to deplete it. And look at these final statistics, they are absolutely insane. 4.7 million walls, 420,000 underground belts. The kill graph is even better. Almost half a million nest kills. I have never seen anything even remotely close. This has to be some sort of world record. Plus more biter kills than both my rampant runs combined times two. The evolution factor is an absurd 0 0.9993, and if that's not a world record, that's definitely a personal record. But where was I? Oh yeah. Oh, the entire world is a lie. But I think I know how I can break the simulation. There. That should do it. I'll see you all on the other side. Oh yeah, I'd like to thank my patrons for supporting these videos and going out of their way to fund stupid things like this.